Welcome everyone. We're so glad that you're joining us here today for a panel on the somatic principles. And I'm very excited to introduce to you the first of our guests today, Kayla June, and she's the founder of Soma Kini School, co-creator of the podcast Emergent Liberation Collective and developer of somatic groundwork. Kayla has dedicated her life to guiding movement as medicine and believes that the somatic way offers radical renewal in our vision for social change that emerges from the inside out, Soma to Soma. Welcome, Kayla. Wonderful to be here. Thank you for having us, Gayatri. And you are going to introduce to us the next guest. Yeah, I'm honored to introduce Emery M. Moore Jr. He's a registered somatic movement educator and therapist. He's the founder and CEO of EM Arts Wellness and Company. He is an internationally renowned multi-certified somatic exercise and movement teacher with over 30 years experience in a myriad of disciplines, including but not limited to martial arts, dance, yoga, Qigong, Pilates, gyrotonic, movement therapies, and body work. Welcome. Hi. Thank you so much. And I'm honored to introduce Ms. Suresha Hill, is the founder and president of the Marin Center for Somatic Education and developer of neurosomatic integration and whole body integration. She has degrees in education and psychology, is a HANA somatic educator, a diplomat in osteopathic manipulative theories and practices. <laughs> Suresha has contributed four books dedicated to self-sensing, self-regulation, and mindful movement. Welcome, Suresha. Thank you. And I should say, welcome back, all three of you, to the Somatic Movement Summit. Thank you. And uh, you have been invited here to speak on one of my absolutely favorite topics, the somatic principles as applied to life, because you have spent your lives many, many years um, inquiring into the somatic field and practicing different somatic disciplines. Uh, so who better to share with us the depth and wonder of the somatic principles than the ones who have walked it? So let's begin to speak a little bit about what are the somatic principles? Which ones uh, are we going to lift? I like to speak to my clients about gentleness and slowness and repetition. Because for one thing, you have to include how the brain learns and how the body learns, but also in order to kind of overwrite or override whatever's already there in autopilot, you need to enable the brain to pick it up. So it needs to be really slow, non-threatening, gentle, and then it can be more easily received. The change can happen a lot more I guess quickly and be more lasting. I would, I would agree with that. And I would like to add, um, I always think about the breath. The breath is the language that the body knows. Um, it's a way to communicate to the body and to receive feedback. It's like a two way. Um, you get feedback, but you're able actually to communicate in a deeper way with yourself. And um, alignment, I always say alignment, alignment, alignment. And what I mean by that is a dynamic alignment, something that stays with you all the time, um, making a shape, becoming that shape and being mindful of what you can use it for, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Yeah, I'm thinking about how both of what you each spoke to is this process of tuning into SOMA is how I name it. Uh, so this ability to really use our mind as an observational tool to witness our body, to witness the lived experience, to witness the presence that we're in right now. And I agree with you, Emery, that the breath is one of the most accessible and also potent ways to begin tuning in to our experience. Beautiful answers, all three of you. And Suresha, you were naming to slow down. <laughs> Right? Yes, because 
not only do we live in a, in a really fast paced world, but the body is primed to do things very quickly. So you don't have to think about it. So it's just milliseconds before whatever that action is, is instituted. And in order for a change to happen, you know, it, if, if you slow it down, not only can the brain perceive it, but we can perceive it. We're on autopilot as well as the body. And I like, I like to help people to understand that the, the body is always listening, but you have to be speaking its language. So if you, if you go slowly, not only can the body perceive it and the brain perceive it, but we can perceive it. And that is the key for the body to know that something is, is going to change here and that you want it to change. The, the, the body's actually listening to us. So if we can't tune it in, I mean, many people are so good at so many things, right? But how does it feel to be doing what we're doing? So if mm. you slow it down, you can make those little distinctions, you know, you can differentiate this sensation from that sensation and understand what it means. And then your body also understands what it means to you and what it means for the change you wanna see. Yeah, and what I'm hearing there is also that slowness in order to ignite the learning process. For sure, for sure. I, I think that um, we've learned so many things. If you wanna learn something new if you break it down into its little baby steps, its little increments, you can decide, and Emery probably knows this with dance, there's so many subtleties and martial arts, there's so many little bitty changes that you wanna make in order to have it be smooth and fluid and controlled. And there are a lot of little fibers and little muscles and little angles that you're gonna be able to actually bring on board to participate in that process if it's slow, if it's quick, the body can perceive it, the unconscious can perceive it, but can we perceive it? So that also makes a big difference for what we can know to perceive to change. Certain disciplines require um, that you slow things down. I mean, from just from a um, conditioning perspective, the slower you are, the more gravity imposes its force on you over time. And so it's a strengthening agent as well, particularly when you're talking about getting past the muscular system and getting into the tendons. And a lot of people don't understand how important it is to strengthen the tendons in form, in alignment, in motion. And then the sensory feedback loop, it's essential that you have a way in which you can access that loop that's practical and in real time. Because the thing about martial arts and about dance is that it's very interactive with the environment. I see a lack of harmony in the way that people move in their environment and that causes a lot of discord internally and externally. I think in order to really access harmony, you have to be at a level where you can perceive when you're out of sync and moving slower gives your mind, body, spirit chance to kind of align when you're paying attention, which is why I love the breath so much because it's very difficult to kind of be out of sync if you're moving with the breath. It's kind of one of the first layers of understanding there's a rhythm to this thing. Bringing in the environment seems really important right now because we're talking about, I mean, one of the you know, intentions of this panel right here is to talk about how somatic practice um, helps to uh, encourage more joyful, satisfying, connected living, right? And my um, experience has been that many people first understand somatics as a very personal investigation. And even I've had the question about it being kind of self-centered. It's true that the somatic inquiry will start with kind of the self-research and, and the learning of ourselves to a certain extent. But you know, what you're bringing up, Emery, is this kind of relational field. And I experienced that too as a dancer and am so thankful that that's what some of the first somatic experiences I had, right? Was relationship with space, relationship with bodies, relationship with breath and the presence of others. Our, you know, I think about this as a somatic way is that we begin inter, intrapersonal with intrapersonal skills 
And then over time, we take that into interpersonal skills or interrelationship with the world that we're embedded within. Please, Zeresha. I was just gonna say, I was really glad that Kayla brought in relationships because you know, nothing happens in isolation in the body. Everything is always involved. And a lot of times we're drawn to a focal point of where some type of symptom or discomfort is showing up as an imbalance, but it's only in imbalance in relationship. So, I mean, Emery spoke about relationship to an environment, but there's also this inner terrain where there's one area that's receiving additional forces because it's not balanced with the rest of the system, whether it be the skeletal system or the mus muscular system, connective tissue, if it's the fluid system, there's something restricted somewhere energetically or wherever it is. And if you open that up, then its relationship begins to thrive with the rest of the systems. So they're multi systems and right, you need to have them all communicating with one another. And I, I just love that idea of relationship um, on so many levels, Kayla. So thanks for bringing that up. That, that's an important concept that I think is overlooked in commercial fitness or just in a Western mindset is the interrelationship of pretty much everything. In Taoist thought and theory, the body is a small universe. And so to speaking to your point, Kyla, Kayla, excuse me if I'm mispronouncing your name, <laughs> is that um, the inquiry may seem as if it's an internal selfish kind of thing, but we are really are mirrors of what goes on externally as well. Um, there isn't really much different because we're, we're part of the cosmos. So the mechanisms that work externally work internally as well. And by getting to know what's happening here, I think you can um, reach that resonance with everything else. And that's what I speak about the harmony. You know, even what you put inside yourself when you put inside your body, something simple as you eat something and you realize, wow, that didn't feel good just to even tap into forgetting about, you know, what it is per se, but just paying attention. It's like, that doesn't feel good. So I should do that again. And later on, you can get maybe into a deeper study of why it didn't feel good, but paying attention is a big deal for people. Yes, paying attention. So that leads us to directly to the next somatic principle, paying attention or becoming aware becoming present with ourselves as a step to becoming, being able to really sense the whole of ourselves. So how do you relate to this term awareness and where does it come into the somatic practice? Well, there is a difference between attention and awareness from, from my view and you become, you can be aware of where your attention goes and what, changes happen just because of that attention. So I, yeah, I really, I really think that awareness is a very powerful language that the being understands and then transmits, transmits into the form. So many times changes will happen just with the presence and your awareness of your presence. And then again, your body's incredible incredible sensitivity and intelligence just perks up when it feels your presence in an aware conscious way so that mindfulness and again awareness is different than mindfulness but that that mindfulness of what's happening with you and with your body during the day just creates an incredible amount of levity of integration and harmony and Awareness is the, is the base of it all, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and then there's this next kind of step, Suresha, that I'm thinking about from there, which is how do we then apply this into our relationships? And how do we apply this into the really difficult work that we have to do as a human species, as a culture within our communities, um, to you know, dismantle these systems of oppression that doesn't serve the vitality, the harmony, the balance of any of us. And so one of the you know, first things I consider here is this tuning in, 
attention to breath and then learning to understand our own nervous system. And that's one of, I think the most impactful skills of attention and awareness is learning to track my own nervous system so that I can, um, you know, ensure that I'm communicating from a creation oriented, a generative place rather than uh, reactive and, you know, responding into the world through some kind of, you know, implicit bias or something like that. And so this ability for each of us to really kind of have the responsibility of knowing ourselves or tracking ourselves, it changes everything then in how we can be present with one another and in problem solving type uh, circumstances. Wow, there are so many layers and points of view, um, not points of view, but perspectives that come into to what you just said. What precedes what precedes what precedes that? And, you know, there, I, I think initially there's got to be um, a desire to relate to your environment and to others in a compassionate, in a kind in a caring way that evolves into something that brings more harmony. And just like you said, when there's a lot of noise in the nervous system or predetermined reactivity and hypervigilance or whatever it is, you know, so many of us, I mean, just being born is such a trauma, right? So, you know, there's so many initiations along the way that you need to overcome in order to be able to reset, to have that space to even have a new thought come in, um, that's a challenge. But if the desire is there, then that desire informs how everything in you relates to what's in front of you and how to improve that. And you come back in the, in the end of the day and look at, was that the best way that I could have responded and what could be better and then you just that also is informing your whole soma your whole system and it really downloads every night from existence that supports the change that you want to see the harmony that you want to create and we are co-creating with the whole so that initial thought that initial desire and intention begins to create and form that next relationship or that next dialogue or that next activity that you want to see happen socially. I would, I would say from my perspective, I'm a very practical person because I was born in the fire. A lot of stuff going on around me that you read about in the newspapers. Um, and for me, my work has always been centered about what can I do really to help people? Um, I've been practicing what people call Qigong or internal cultivation now for about 30 years. And about 23, 24 years ago, I was um, really fortunate to come upon the practice of Falun Dafu, also known as Falun Gong. You may have heard of it now. It's being persecuted in China by the CCP. But what I found is it's difficult to find a genuine practice. It's difficult to find a practice in which it actually works. Uh, there are a lot of barriers to entry when you're trying to reach a certain level. There's a lot of crap out there. Um, you can go down a lot of roads and exhaust yourself trying to find something that actually works and there's something that's actually good for you and it's not about commerce, but actually has the principles. And the principles that we work with primarily are truth, compassion, and forbearance but there's an actual on-ramp, there's an actual way to access those things through the meditative exercises. In this particular system, there are five. And I've found that doing CD meditation or standard meditation is one of the most powerful experiences I've ever had because standing or sitting in stillness over long periods of time and keeping the mind in, in harmony or keeping the mind calm it brings about things that it's just indescribable. But how do we bring that to people in practice? How do we actually bring um, that to the world where folks have a way in which they can practice? Because a lot of times I find conceptually, yes, that's fine. But where's the on-ramp? Where's the practical, actual tools for people um, 
And there's so much out there to fool them now. There's so much they have to wade through before they can actually get to things that are really helpful, which is why I do panels like this. And I'm honored to be on panels like this with practitioners of yourselves who are doing good work. That's a really good point, Emery. Um, I, I, I return to um, the, the desire for that change to happen. I know in the beginning, um, one of my teachers had several active meditations that had stages so that by the end of the of the meditation, the last 15 minutes, now there's enough discharge that has happened so that the nervous system, the mind, whatever all those energies are that are swirling around, paying attention to other things can have settled so that there is a perception of what that silence is. Usually, I think the mind is so active in most people that it's very difficult for them to perceive something in between those thoughts or, you know, in between the, the words on the page so that they can even hear that stillness. I know once I went out into the desert and the desert was so, so silent and still that I could hear the noise of a fly was so overpowering. I felt like, oh my gosh, you know, and if you can receive that impression and carry it with you, now you've got a background to differentiate everything else and maybe can return to it. It can take time, but if there's that initial impetus of desire and intention, you just, like you said, forbearance, you continue and eventually it, it reveals itself, maybe shorter for some, maybe longer for some, depending on your, your experience and how much fire you've had to go through. But a teacher also once said, uh, 100% devotion to a false prophet is better than half 50% devotion to a true prophet. So that will carry you, I think, if you're absolutely passionate to get there and you hold that as a high value, that inner wisdom of yourself will take you to the place that you want to get to. It's just you can't give up, you know what I mean? You can't give up when it gets tough because when it gets tough is when you need that silence, when you need that stillness, when you need that space and you return to that as the, the truth instead of leaning in all the way to the noise. Yeah, I consider that scares this... me. <laughs> what did you say? What scares please, you? God, please, Kayla. I don't want to monopolize, please. <laughs> Well, I want to know what scares you. Now you've got me hanging on a yeah. kind of edge here. <laughs> well, 100% devotion to something false is like my worst nightmare because I've spent all my life trying to find the true things. And I know what deception can do. I would much rather have 50% of something real than 100% of something that isn't that, because that's what's going on. Like the emphasis... And our society is on how people are being good. People have forgotten what good is. Mm -hmm. that, that concept, there used to be a time when if you were doing something bad, somebody could say to you, hey, you're doing something bad. And you, they would agree with you. They might not stop, but at least they'd know where the line is. Now, mm -hmm. it's like goodness has become this lost thing. And I think that the deception, that's a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really big problem because there are a lot of people out there that want to change. They want something real. They need something real. And what they get is snake oil and shark fin juice and crystals and things when they've got cancer and they're, you know, they need things that are actually going to help. So that scares me. Yeah, there aren't, there aren't, I don't think that many actually pure manifestations of what goodness is. But if your commitment and your devotion is to the goodness, then you return always to the goodness in yourself within whatever it seemed like that was deceiving you. And then that, whatever that deception is, informs you as well of what was it in me that leaned into something that was deceptive and what does that show me about where my awareness is, where my naivete is, where my, uh, what do you call that, fantasies are, 
but you you lean back into that stillness and silence, which is always good. And then the other stuff that leaned on top of it evaporates and you continue with your own inner goodness. So, you know, you, you, you can't really um, paint a picture outside of yourself of what it will look like and then let yourself feel betrayed over and over again by, by appearances. You just keep falling back into what goodness is in your own system, where your awareness lands in that stillness and silence. And then let how that dance plays out in manifestation keep moving on because a lot of times it leads to something good anyway. I don't know if you've seen that in your life, but some of the things that shocked me the most in my childhood got me on this path. I was so fascinated and, and perplexed by the lack of health in my community and in my family and why people were getting sick and dying, you know, in their thirties, forties, fifties, I just felt like, what, what, what could be doing that, you know? And, and that question, I just stayed with that question. And the, the reasons could be, I mean, you could say in a word, stress, right? Stress and trauma. And it took me to an, an, another answer and another answer and another answer. None of those answers were the complete answer, but I stayed with the question. Mm -hmm. And it kept opening out and opening out and opening out into more and more beautiful solutions, at least for myself and for my own health. And for the, you know, and then transmitting it to others is like, can you stay with that question for yourself? Can you stay with it? Can you sense it in yourself? What is your body trying to say? What are you telling your body? What is your mind trying to reflect in terms of what you're trying to say? Mm -hmm. It's a true reflection of the complexity that we're getting into. And I think is what often um, keeps people from choosing somatic inquiry or somatic practice. And it's true that, you know, this is uh, anything that is talking about human behavior and relationship and this miracle of, uh, of a body that we're living in life essentially flowing through us is gonna get complex. There's something here that you said where I go, and in complexity, I've also had a hard time kind of like being able to align with what is good or what is right. We get into places of confusion, shadow, all that kind of stuff. And I have found, and this is a little bit different than what you're saying, Suresha, but I think just it's just a reflection of it that coming into what you're calling stillness, I call presence of being, coming there, opening up spaciousness, settling into the moment, grounding into here and now, feet on the earth, breath in my body, eyes in the space, and then goodness might emerge. You know, like I might not know <laughs> what it is, where it is, how to go, which direction to take, but it is true coming back into this moment, creating space for something else. And often, you know, that, that settling, uh, uh, returning back towards some sort of harmony does occur. If one has ever experienced harmony, then you have that reference point. Yeah. But a lot of people have never had that reference point. And so there's nothing for them to settle into but chaos. And so what my concern is, is that there are a lot of false paths and that there is a right, there is a wrong, just like there's a left and right and up and down. And these kinds of panels are important because there should be a differentiation to be with someone who's qualified and knowledgeable and not that we know everything. That's not what I'm suggesting, but there's a difference between good work that is able to be almost infinite because what we do doesn't have any end. And then there are things that lead to a cul-de-sac. And so 
in our profession, as you know, there are many, many different avenues to get to the same place. And that's one thing I like because this is a very individual experience for people. One approach, I've never used the same approach with a different person, even the same person, I'm constantly manipulating the medium so that they can get a better experience. That's what I love about this work. The good, the, the good aspects of this work, the real aspects of this work is that it can be tailored to the individual and that the principles are real and powerful and they can be communicated to help people and enhance the daily experience. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And to me, what's been very powerful also is that true somatic work to me strengthens the person to feel what is right for themselves. That, that it's like it really supports autonomy and freedom on a, on a very core level. That if we approach our students and we approach ourselves with the attitude that I can uncover my own truth. If I quieten myself, if I, if I center myself, what, what Kayla was saying, grounding in different way, uh, presencing ourselves, we know what the next right step for us is. We know how to move, like Suresha said, with the wholeness of ourselves. So to me, the somatic work has always been very transparent. I always call it, it's very honest work because it's not about making anyone do something that they don't want to do. It's about supporting the individual to discover more of who they are truly. And you're speaking about the goodness. And I really agree with you, Emery, that goodness is not maybe valued as much as in the past in the world. And how can we, I believe that the somatic principles are ways for us to Reaccess our own goodness, and with that, we can bring that into the collective. So, let's speak a little more about that. Like, how do we move the principles? And you have each already touched on it. How do we move these principles into everyday life? What is the bridge for you? What is the usefulness? Let's go another layer with that. I think a really important distinction is switching to the other side of the looking glass so that your guide is within. We've, we've been talking about that a little bit and we've been taught to externalize everything to empower everything outside of us to give us a reflection of who and how we are, even what we are. So when we switch and we look to inside for where the goodness is, for where the value is, for where the information is, and we get our information from within, that would be revolutionary. Then you start to self-sense, and I don't know if you've experienced this, Gayatri, in your classes, but people are happy to learn how to do the movements and to learn how to tune into mindfully doing the movements, but to tune into how it feels to be themselves, how it feels to be in the body, what the body feels like while they're doing the movements. That I think is the bridge, you know, to help people to want to tune in to themselves, to listen, to get information from themselves. That's the scary place to me, Emery. I think that's the scary place. People say, well, just, tell, just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do. Rather than go inside and let their body, let their being, let their heart tell them what there's to do. A, there's a reason for that, that people want you to tell them what to do. It's mm -hmm. because historically, that's what they've been told is medicine. Mm -hmm. They've given away the self-determination to professionals who are supposed to know better. That was the culture that was fostered in this Western environment. But I think it starts, the bridge for me is really simple. It starts with one question. How are you feeling today? How are you feeling today? Not what do you look like? Not how it felt yesterday. Not what you think you should be like, but how are you feeling today? And once you tap into that 
and then you do your routines or you do your exercise or whatever it is based on that, it becomes a whole different ball game. Then you can make adjustments based on reality and based on what you really need versus, well, 10 days ago, I used to be able to do blah, blah, blah. Or yesterday I felt like da, 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 da. Or I wanna look like, and so also those things for feed into your life. I always say, if it doesn't leave the mat, it's not worth doing. Don't study things that, that, you, can't, that you can't utilize in your, your life. It's not worth it. Who's got time for that? If it's not relevant to you, if you're, it's particularly when we're talking about pathologies and therapeutic application of the work, which is my favorite thing to do because it generally cuts through the noise because people's focus is a lot more dynamic. They're like, this hurts. <laughs> I can't do this. <laughs> I used to be able to do this. <laughs> It's important because I can't walk anymore, sit or stand anymore, or hold this class anymore. Can you help me? <laughs> and that becomes, to me, a nice entry point for people. I agree because that's where their attention is. Their attention is on what hurts and what doesn't work. And um, you know, I'm reminded of, of, a, of a patient who had nine surgeries back surgeries and they all failed and she was limited so limited in what she could do in her daily life and i said well let's let's look at modifying what you can do what you can do so that it's a yes instead of a no you know if you if you can't move here can you move here if you can't carry 5 pounds of groceries can you carry 1 pound if you can't carry it hanging down like this, can you carry it next to your body? You know, and by the time we got finished modifying how she was using her body, her life opened up exponentially. So part of it, I think, is a shift from looking at what your body says yes to, honor what it says no to, but modify until you get to that yes. Modify feeling into where there isn't any pain, not everything hurts. Where is it that it doesn't hurt? What position can you get into that feels just fine, that feels at least neutral? This is just fantastic. I am so happy to listen to all three of you and the wisdom that is coming out. The depth of the principles applied to life. Like you said, Suresha, the client's life quality changed. It grew. And so at the beginning of the session, Suresha, you mentioned gentleness as one of the somatic principles. So before we close this session, I would like to also cover gentleness. And you also spoke about ease and comfort. So how do these principles translate in, into life skills for you? Kayla. How do they translate into life skills? I, I suppose that I consider practice to be the doorway that opens up this question of what ease and comfort is anyway. I agree with you, Emery, that so many people don't necessarily even have a map or kind of an experiential understanding of what comfort or ease or harmony or any of these things even feels like in our body. We don't even, we don't know what we don't know. We don't know what possibility there is, right? So there's something about, and this is my intention with somatic groundwork, which is a practice that I teach, to have something in place that allows you to come into the experience of what that is. And I think there's a lot of different ways to get there, right? And then to be able to really kind of soak up the, the experience at the end of the practice to name it. And I like to talk about creating a nervous system map. Like, oh, this is a possibility. I can be this way in my body. Oh, I had no idea. I can feel this way in my mind. Okay, how can I return back to here? How can I name it? How can I create, you know, some kind of a pillar or a marker for this? So it's that reference point. And then that allows me to come into ease and gentleness in my life because I've had a lived experience of it. And the more times I practice coming into that, 
it starts to accumulate. And then I have more of that in my life. And I, you know, my students and clients say the same thing. We start to gather more of those uh, moments in, in our day. I think gentleness is really important because of the amount of threatening situations that we mostly have perceived throughout our lives. Like Emery was saying that there's so much chaos that people land in so much, so many charged situations. And if we learn and teach our clients to be gentle with themselves, the threat level goes down immensely just in the tissue field, just in the nervous system. And it's ready to listen rather than, you know, react or defend or get into that fight flight mode, even not knowing that that's where you live in. And moving gently communicates that same thing to the body. So if you move very, very gradually and very, very gently, even if it had been or currently is in a lot of pain or stiffness or discomfort, or feeling like I've never been able to, whatever that is, lift this, carry that, move this. If you move very, very gently, the body is much more likely to accept mm -hmm. the invitation to do something new, to move within that pain and open up something that reduces the pain. So I think gentleness and, and slowness is, is very, very key. And the same in relationship, being gentle with one another, the, the person you're in relationship with is much more likely to be able to receive what you're saying and hear it and, and let, it, let it land in a way that's non-threatening. Emery, you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, I was thinking about for me, one of the principles is grace. I think about gentleness, I think about grace, because um, it's important to me that it's beautiful. I always say that you can tell when a movement is right because it's beautiful. Um, when you see a movement or an animal, it's moving in a certain way, jerky, staccato, you realize there's something wrong. There's a flow to everything. There's five elements, water, wood, earth, fire, metal. We're supposed to embody these things. There's supposed to be a coordinated balance. And the understanding of when we're not in balance or when we're using too much metal, when we're too much fire, when we're too much water, when we're giving too much in terms of yielding too much or when we're pushing too much out into the world, those are both the same problems. As, as Sifu Kenny Gong used to say, rest his soul, too little, too much, same problem. And um, gentleness is important in terms of an approach, particularly in the West, whereas that's that's a concept that doesn't come around often. Folks are generally not taught that they have to have any gentleness toward themselves. Um, it's always boom, 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 boom. And that's one of the reasons why I focus on teaching people how to let go um, as an entire curriculum. You know, how do you produce movement by letting go? How do you release instead of, everyone knows how to turn things on now. If I said, turn it on, people could turn it on. I'd say, turn it up, you could turn it up. If I say, turn it down, they're confused. What do you mean, turn it down? I say, well, you turned it up, turn it down. <laughs> Can you turn it down even more? <laughs> mm -hmm. And so that's important is to be able to have access to techniques and understandings that allow you to be able to do those things. And to self-regulate, to down-regulate, yeah. to yeah. settle ourselves. So thank you for the richness of the conversation. And now that we're coming towards the end of the session, I would love to hear from you. Where can students find you when they want to study with you? And also after you share that, also say, is there anything that you want to leave the, the viewers with? An inspiration or reminder of any kind? Suresha. So um, listeners can find me at uh, www.neurosomatics.net. And I also have a Facebook page for Marin Center for Somatic Education. Um, what I would like to leave as a gift is just to know, be aware that the body is always advocating for you. It's doing its best to get you 
into the best possible version of yourself. It's listening for instructions from you. It's super intelligent, super responsive, super cooperative with you. So I just want to share that so that you hold that in high regard that your body is here for you. Thank you. And Kayla. Thank you, Gayatri, for this opportunity. Suresha, Emery, it's been a real pleasure and I've learned a lot being here with both of you at this on this panel. My website is www.kaylajunemyname.com. You can also find me on Instagram at somakinese.school. I'd love to hear from you. I, I think after what you just mentioned, Suresha, what's really present for me is a teaching of how we always are, already have been whole. And to re-enter that as a lived experience, it can be a slow drip process, one moment at a time, one small pause at a time, and that can be enough. Thank you, Kayla. And Emery? I can be found <laughs> at www.em-studio.org, and I'm on Instagram and Facebook. You can just type in my name, Emery M. Moore Jr., and I'll pop up in there somewhere. Um, I guess what comes to mind is, is try to take yourself as you are right now and move forward from that point and cut yourself some slack. Try not to have visions of what you would like for yourself to be or visions of how it used to be, the self-recrimination, the guilt, I should have, could have, would have, all those are those are barriers to getting better. If you focus on the process, the outcome is guaranteed. If you have a good process, you'll have a good outcome. You have to trust in the universal forces, the harmony, that if you do the right thing, the right thing will be done for and to you. Thank you. And thank you all three for the wisdom shared here today. There's such richness and depth that lies within the somatic approach. And I'm grateful that you uncovered some of them together today. And so thank you for your time and thank you all for listening. It's been a wonderful session with Suresha Hill, Kayla June and Emery M. Moore Jr. Thank you so much all for listening. <laughs>